before we get into the questions, guys, Ron and I were chatting before we came on air about what we're seeing in terms of public-private partnerships right now. And you know, we've, we're in a week where we saw SpaceX put, put people up on the International Space Station, which I think is a great example of the um, private-public sector. But Ron, you were telling me about some interesting um, developments in the semiconductor industry and what the semiconductor associations were, were looking for in terms of uh, assistance. Yeah, so, and I think it's in response to everything that we're hearing about, you know, out of Washington about we got to move some stuff back here. We've got to be less reliant on China, whether it's for medical or key technologies and stuff. And so, you know, the Semiconductor Industry Association put out, you know, kind of a white paper and a request to the government this week, you know, looking for $37 billion. And, you know, it's $5 billion for a fab, which I think that's a little bit light, but mm-hmm. um, they want to do a public-private partnership where, you know, the government will own it, some kind of shared time model. I don't think they've really worked out all the details. Another five for kind of a prototyping slash technology center, then uh, $17 billion for a federally funded research. Uh, be interesting okay. to see where that goes. As you remember from last week, you know, we had a congressional candidate um, attended this and, you know, asked a question about, you know, how do we bring some of this stuff back? And interestingly yeah. enough, you know, we had sent him a fairly lengthy response specifically about semiconductors, you know, you now people are out there uh, and now trying we to see fund this. it, so we'll see. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, I think the whole, but the whole government response is, uh, is fascinating, not, not, not so much in the, well, obviously in the immediate term, but in how they, how they get involved in the reshaping of an industry and the pressure they put on and what we're seeing overseas. And I thought that first piece of news from the Japanese government with um, two or $3 billion to um, shift, shift the supply chain out of China was, was absolutely fascinating. And that was quite yeah, the, a shock. The two to three was targeted. The, the total package was 21 billion. Wow. 21 wow. billion in incentives to move stuff from China to Japan. Yeah. So rather than have a big preamble this week, let's get straight into it with uh, Mark. Um, perhaps we can start, Ron, with a quick introduction to how you know Mark and uh, uh, your thoughts on, on the, the, the man at the bottom of the screen right now. Very good. The man's in the upper right hand uh, corner of my screen. So I've known Mark maybe maybe 10 or 12 years. Um, I like to say that the EMS business is the world's smallest $800 billion business. Um, People just kind of know each other, whether you run into each other, you know, pitching the same customers or, um, you know, my company, the supply chain resources group, you know, we've placed a number of pieces of business uh, at Jable over the years. And I've been fortunate enough to get to know Mark. Um, One of the most thoughtful people in the EMS industry. Um, You know, it's really easy to, to get, you know, down in, in the weeds and work on that execution and try and find an extra two tenths of a point and, and forget about the strategy and how strategy might add half a point or a point. And so I've always enjoyed my conversations with Mark. He's very thoughtful. And um, I think everybody's going to get a good uh, taste for that today. Great. Welcome, Thank Mark. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's just start briefly with what's been going on with with you guys over the last over the last few months you know ridiculously challenging time as um ron says you're thoughtfully planning and developing a business and you've done an amazing job over the last uh over the last few years in terms of, of growing growing jable's presence and and size in the market um but then you get this huge disruption and initially you get a supply chain disruption and a wave of disruption in your factories in China and then it works its way around the world. And then you've got demand disruptions as, as you've got demand for different products rising and ebbing and flowing. And then you've got all these workplace disruptions. Give me a, give me a sense for how that's, how that's been for, for, for you and for Jable. Uh well, it's um, it started for us in in um, mid January. So we uh, we have we have about fifty four sites around the world, give or take. Uh, we we started getting pulled into um, the COVID issues. We have a design center in Wuhan, so kind of uh, at the center uh, of the whole deal. 
So we started taking phone calls as folks were trying to get back from Chinese New Year's towards the end of January and um, had no idea then uh, the magnitude of all this. So started paying attention to it, worked closely with our team in China. That actually gave us a big advantage as, as, the, as the virus started moving around the world. Um, I would say that uh, uh, you know we had our December earnings call and then we had our March earnings call mid-March. Even as our March earnings call, um, things were things were suspect, but it was it was a week or two after our earnings call where kind of the shit hit the fan, and it was like, oh my gosh, uh, uh, the whole world potentially is going to shut down for a period of time. And um, I would say that, uh, boy, um, you know, now we sit here in early June. And uh, the things that we've learned, the way in which we're get, we think we'll conduct business on the back side of this, we build a little bit of everything. Um, and I would say of the of the twelve or thirteen end markets that we serve today, we serve about 430, 440 brands. Uh, um, all of our factories are up at uh, up and running, so we have about fifty two million square feet of manufacturing space. Every factory is up and running now. Uh, our lowest utilization rate is probably in the low 70 percent, um, uh, and that's balanced with factories that are running at 100 percent. So I, I would characterize of the 12 or 13 different end markets and the products we build, about a th um, let's say a third of them are strong, a third of them are kind of holding their own, and, and a third of them are weak. But um, along with running the business and executing. We've been spending a lot of time as a leadership team just talking about, you know, what the backside of this may look like, yeah. uh, what does it mean as our people come back and, and whatnot. So it's uh, it's kind of been double duty uh, for, for our folks. And uh, I think they're getting a little bit tired. Uh, everybody's yeah. kind of uh, either on Zoom or on Microsoft Teams or on WebEx. And um, I think the last lack of human connection um, uh, has some issues, but, uh, but again, it's also taught us a lot on how we might do things differently on the backside of all this. Yeah. And I think that's the fascinating thing. I think we're, you know, I, I look at it as having three stages. There's the urgent stage, which we're, we're kind of still in at the moment where we're, you know, we're, we're, we're putting out fires, we're, we're fixing stuff. We're, you know, helping wherever, wherever we can in the fight against COVID with PPE, with ventilators, with all those uh, with all those different things, then we have this kind of important phase of going through um, some kind of recovery. But as you say, meanwhile, you've got to look at the far side of the problem and into the distance and try and figure out what the what the model is going forward. And I know that's some of the stuff that Ron particularly wants to ask about. But before we get into that, I just wanted to get a feel for what Jabil's role has been specifically in the fight against COVID in terms of, you know, supplying and producing PPE. I saw a press release with um, uh, Philips regarding the ramping up of ventilator production. And they actually mentioned Jabil and Flex in the, in the title of, uh, in the title of the press release, which made me feel good that collaboration was um, well in the, in the EMS industry. So that's always nice to see. Tell me a bit about your your how you see your role in actually in actually helping with the crisis. Uh, it's a little bit. It was a little bit ad hoc, and now it's maybe a little bit more strategic, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a better word. When we um, when things started occurring in China, we as we started reopening factories and moving slowly, uh, our first our first kind of job one, job two, one A, one B for our employees was keeping them safe. Mm -hmm. And um, myself and our leadership team absolutely didn't want to put anybody in harm's way. So we actually worked very closely with our folks on the ground in China, started developing processes and protocols. Um, part of that was uh, everybody uh, uh, was going to wear some type of surgical or protective masks. And uh, we went out into the marketplace uh, the masks weren't all that good, and the and the pricing was such that we started doing the math on this as things started extrapolating around the world. Going, we have two hundred and thirty thousand employees. Let's say one hundred and sixty of them, one hundred and sixty thousand have to wear masks every day. That starts adding up pretty quick. So we got together with our um, engineers, 
our folks that do robotics and automation, uh, they tried a series of different uh, equipment over a two week period. Long story short, uh, today we're building about a million masks a day. We consume okay. about we consume about 100, 120,000 of those masks a day. And, and we provide masks to everybody f- from the government to customers to suppliers to supermarkets, airlines, et cetera. Uh, so that's how we got into the mask business. Yeah. And, uh, and we see that surprisingly, we, I, think that, I think that demand will probably hold for quite some time. Yeah. And then um, we have a 3D additive uh, 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 part of our business, material science part. So we then moved into um, recyclable N95 masks. So if you can imagine a 3D printed N95 mask with liquid silicon rubber around the boundaries to make it very comfortable fit uh, with, a, with a filter insert. And, and we did a lot of work in terms of breathability, uh, fluid dynamics, things like that, with the diameter of the filter. And we're now producing recyclable N95 masks, and, and those are just coming into volume. And then of our, of our I don't know, our, our $28 billion in, in top line, we have a very large healthcare business. And so um, we've, been, we've been building um, ventilators uh, and ventilator subcomponents for a while. And that business, uh, that business just naturally grew into um, about a four or five X of our normal ventilator business. And then everything from pulse oximetry type of, 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 of devices to manifolds on how to, how to reorientate some of the equipment that we're building specifically for COVID and on and on. So um, again, I, I, we got into all this and I don't know that we'll make much money at it. Um, I don't know how sustainable it is, but as a, as a team, we felt like it was the right thing to do and I'm glad we did it. It also, for right or wrong, it, it, uh, it brought us probably two degrees closer to dealing with both a variety of state governments as well as um, lots and lots of conversations with DC. So, you, so it, it afforded us the opportunity to kind of see some of that stuff from the inside out. Yeah. It's interesting when you talk about those discussions with DC when um, when this first thing started and you know they were up, they were asking car companies to make ventilators and all that kind of thing. I remember having a couple of conversations with Ron and saying, "Hey, you got to ask the EMS guys. There's nobody on the on planet Earth that's more capable of pivoting production of moving from one project to another of you know leveraging new technologies because you you guys are doing that every day and there are some great examples there. You have that amazing um, additive part to your additive manufacturing part to your business. So have you been impressed with the agility and the speed at which the team have been able to pivot? Or do you feel that you've always had that ability and you were just, you know, it was like a coiled spring waiting, waiting and ready to go. Um, I, I'm always proud of our team. I mean, we, um, let me think. We 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 probably we ship we ship a hundred million dollars of product out of the company, one hundred and twenty million dollars of product of the company every day, and and I've been with the company nearly thirty years, and I'm not sure any any single day has been the same amount of SKUs going out of the company or the same type of SKUs. So, uh, and and you know, again, I've uh, I've known Ron a long time, and we talk about the fact that to be in this business, uh, we don't have a single customer that forecasts their business properly. Um, some get the SKUs kind of right, some get the overall demand, but you know, um, we have a lot of empathy around, around their challenges because it's put on them by the customer. And, um, you know, we've built a lot of algorithms around that and and that that's helped, uh, kind of level set overall demand. I bring all that up because, um, you know, we live in a business that we have to be flexible and agile. And I think both on the demand planning side. Uh, the reactionary side, and then um, maybe f- more thoughtful or technical on the, on the engineering side. So I think it I think it reeks of ingenuity because yeah. here we put four people together, um, four people together across four different countries, and in two weeks they had taken a bunch of equipment off the shelf, uh, uh, rigged it all differently, and today we've yeah. got. 
uh, you know, a bunch of automation producing a bunch of products. And yeah. that's not, that's not unlike kind of what we, what we typically do. Yeah. And that's been this whole digital transformation drives. Is it, do you think it's the digital transformation that drives agility? Uh, I think it's a combination of digital transformation, augmented reality, uh, machine learning, and our IT system. You know, we're the, yeah. we're the largest manufacturing services business uh, in terms of being U.S. domicile. Um, and uh, the one thing that makes us very unique is, is of our 50 million square feet of manufacturing space, all of our demand planning, all of our factories, all of our machine learning, all of our AIs tied together with a single IT system, that gives us a real competitive advantage because as we're moving inventory around or flexibility or, you know, I don't know where you want to take the conversation, but moving business from China somewhere else or into China or, yeah. or whatever, whatever, we, we do that. We do that constantly. And having, yeah. having an IT backbone that's similar an ERP system that's holistic and, and, uh, and the same. Most of that came from the fact that, uh, you know, I started with a company where $150 million, whatever we're in sales, the vast majority of our growth has been organic. So we've been able to build the systems mm. on our own. Um, and, and again, it's, 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 we do our best to try to make those systems around agility and flexibility because it's a, it's a core to the industry. Yeah, and I think agility was was the big word last year, and I think we've added resilience to that, and we've got this challenge of building agility and resilience and what you were saying about moving stuff from place to place. I know Ron wants to get in and talk a little bit about um, what's going on in terms of where supply chains are shifting, and, and let's kind of move on to what that, that new norm looks like. And you know, the dominance of China in terms of manufacturing, maybe what we're reading in the press and what people are saying with respect to securing supply chains elsewhere and the degree at which, you know, which stuff will change. Where, where do you see, where do you see that going? And perhaps I can just ask you, Ron, what questions are you being asked around that from, um, from um, supply chain resource group customers? I think the biggest question is, you know, how much stuff is realistically going to come back to the United States? Uh, and those tend to be from our smaller customers, our, our large global Fortune 100 customers are really looking for what is, what is the best plus one? Um, you know, we have three or four customers that represent maybe 50% of our business that um, are almost exclusively, you know, China manufacturing. And that's not going to change. They're not going to just pull out of China. So they're looking for a plus one. And so the question is, you know, are two sites in China enough diversification or, you know, should I look at China in some place in Southeast Asia because, you know, the raw material is still going to come from China for, you know, a decade or more, or, you know, should I look at regionalization? And so, you know, there isn't a specific answer to this. It really depends on your end market. It depends on the you know, variability or, predictability of, of both your supply and your demand. Mm -hmm. But it's in general, it's the question is China plus what as opposed yeah. to in what instead of China. Mark, is that something that's discussed in your, in your boardrooms and in your offices on a, on a regular basis? You've got to be constantly looking as a, as a company of your size, you've got to constantly be looking for where manufacturing shifting, what the demands are, what the incentives are, what's, what's pulling and pushing. What do you see right now? Uh, so there was a lot there. Um, there was like 10 questions or thoughts into that. Um, so let me, let me try to take a couple and then tell me where I misspoke or what I didn't address. Um, I'll start with us. So um, the good news is post COVID and even during COVID, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the world that has to be built. And there's fewer, fewer people in the world that can actually build it properly. Uh, scale matters, IT systems matter, experience matters. It's a tight margin business. So again, uh, you know, we take, let's say our EBITDA is a billion eight, uh, going to $2 billion. You know, we, we plow, we plow about 200, $250 million uh, back into the company every year in terms of engineering, R&D, uh, those type of things. If you're not investing 
the whole manufacturing landscape's changing with the and now now we're implementing the use of augmented reality and things like that on the manufacturing floor. Uh, but when we look at our position in China, uh, we have a big healthcare center there. I'm not I'm not overly concerned. I, I think and 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 again, it was just a year ago that the conversation was around. Holy shit, uh, trade tariffs, the set and the other. Um, the vast majority uh, of what we do in China, I, I don't think is gonna. I don't think is gonna move anytime soon, mm -hmm. either because of the indigenous supply chain that's there, or a lot of what we do in China is for China, Asia, or China, Europe, not China, U.S. Yeah. Now COVID comes around, uh, it has people rethinking redundancy, uh, those type of things uh, all around the world. I would say that. Um, maybe to share some data on a macro level, of say our 400 plus customers, about 10% um, about have actually moved uh, all of their manufacturing, eh, probably not even that many, call it, so I'll call it 5%, about 5%, 20 customers have said, hey, I went out of China. Okay. And so we've moved them out of China, and I would say, if, um, and I'll get this directionally correct, of the of the 20 customers that have moved out of china not a single one has brought stuff back to the united states so it's china for vietnam it's china for india it's china for malaysia it's china for indonesia it's china for ukraine it's china for mexico uh ron talked earlier i think and and uh, let me digress or weave around a little bit and and just shut me up if i'm going in directions you don't want me to go in but um I do think, so I've participated in half a dozen conversations uh, all in the last three weeks with very senior government officials and um, technology companies and ourselves combined talking about, is there going to be a relationship between the government and the private sector in subsidations uh, and, and subsidizing big dollars to bring stuff fundamentally back to the U.S.? I think the DOD stuff that belongs in the U.S. The DOD stuff has lots of lots of process and controls around it. I think the U.S. is in good shape there. If I think about though um, taking some of those types of things and maybe implementing some of those types of thoughts and/or decrees, if you will, and the, there's been lots of meetings around. Um, is, does it make any sense, especially if the friction points continue to escalate between U.S. and China? to have a government private uh, uh, thought process around de-risking certain things. But um, I think, I think what will be interesting over the next six months will be how serious will conversations get between public, big public company, U.S. companies and the government in terms of working together to maybe bring some stuff fundamentally back to the U.S. You saw what happened with one large, large fab manufacturer, uh, maybe two, and there's other technologies. So right now, I haven't been part of any conversation where they've said, "Okay, let's do it." Um, I believe that I believe that the that the that the free markets and the capital markets, if it's needed, it'll solution it all on its own. But it'll cost a lot. There'll be a lot of reactionary types of behaviors. Um, what we've said to the government is is um, if there's a real need here, if the friction points um, get to a certain level, it sure would be nice if you'd share that with some of um, the big public companies in the U.S. so we can proactively work this together because we could do it for probably one-tenth of the cost if we actually knew what was going on versus having to react. Um, setting all that stuff aside, in general, uh, to, to the question uh, both you and Ron raised, um, in, 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 you know, unless you're building Boeing airplanes and things like that, I just don't, I don't see, I don't see a lot coming back to the U.S. I do, mm. you know, and, and again, everyone, everyone, customers are always asked, so what are other customers doing? Well, in general, it's this, but everything from, you got to consider logistics costs. You got to consider the indigenous supply chain. What's really going to happen between the U.S. and China? Nobody has a crystal ball. We have an election coming up soon, and gosh knows how that's going to turn out. And what are the new policies going to be? So, um, again, I just ground it. I ground the conversation back to a 400 plus customers. We've had probably 20 yeah. that have that have left China. I will say there's a higher percentage. So let's say behind those 20, 
maybe another 60 to 80 that were sole sourced in China. Um, so maybe a total of 120 leaving and say another 60 be, 80 behind them that have asked us to set up, uh, re, go, 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 go onto their product roadmap and somewhere yeah. out here in this point in time, can we ramp some new products somewhere other than China just so we build in redundancy in a very natural way? And I think that's smart, whether it's geopolitical yeah. issues with China or a single source that might be in the way of a typhoon or, you know, that's just normal supply chain planning. So yeah. I don't know if I answered any of the questions, but that's no, kind you of want you answered lot you answered lots of them, Mark. That was absolutely awesome. And you know what you talk about there at the end is is creating that additional resilience that people are looking for right now with with some redundancy. You mentioned China for Ukraine, China for Mexico, China for um, Vietnam, a whole bunch of others. and And I think India came up in there as well. Where do you see those countries in terms of who do you see as the most likely winners in terms of of business shifting from China? Where do you see as a viable, you know, as viable options, even if it's for very small parts, even if it's just for, you know, redundancy or small numbers? Uh, I don't know that, I, I don't think there's any single winner. I, I can tell mm -hmm. you just um, as a company that literally touches most all products, if I think about Malaysia, I think about Indonesia, I think about Vietnam, I think about Ukraine, I think about Mexico, uh, you know, India, I think India has got to kind of figure out who they are. You know, they're, mm. a, they're a massive population with huge potential, but they're also like a, a jigsaw puzzle of independent kind of democracies, if you will, and, and trying to get decisions taken is difficult. Uh, although love India and we do good business there. I, I, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's a clear winner. And, and yeah. I, and, and my, my hope is, I hope, um, you know, I, I would hope that um, maybe with a little bit more tact and a little bit different approach that we can, we can start to make some progress around uh, the IP infringement issues, um, some of the subsidi subsidization that goes on um, and get to a point where for lack of a better word, and I say this very respectfully because we got 40 plus thousand employees in China and they're awesome uh, and they're, they're not politicians um, and they don't, they treat IP correctly and, 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 and they act exactly like everybody else in Western place acts. Um, I hope we can get to a point of containment that, that allows China to be a part of the supply chain. Mm. I, I think about, um, I think that the world is a better place with uh, when it's when it's when it's um, when there's no boundaries. Yeah, you know it's interesting, Mark. You talk about you know the relationship between us and China and and some of the rhetoric and uh, you know, hopefully that all these borders and, and artificial constraints on trade are not going to pop up. And, you know, a lot of that rhetoric is around, you know, the U.S. being taken advantage of, but we buy products from China and China sells it to us, right? I mean, it's, there, there's, no, there's not been a gun to someone's head that says you have to move it to China, right? And so what you've seen is kind of the unfettered free markets. And, and maybe there should be little throttles here and there. Maybe we should address some of the IP stuff, but I absolutely agree with you that, you know, when, when we start trying to take you know, the invisible hand of that free market out and make it work differently. You know, history tells us and, and, and academicians will tell us and economists will tell us that everyone then becomes worse, worse off. So I absolutely agree with that statement. Let me go back to something you were saying a, a little bit ago. You were saying, you know, you've got a certain number of people that moved out of China, but then you've got some that have like, hey, I, I want China plus something. Um, of those, so let's say you got a, a pretty big customer doing a couple hundred million bucks, and let's call it 200 million bucks they were doing in China. Now you're doing some in China and some in any of these other seven or eight locations that make sense. What does that do to their total cost? Not just their spend with you, but you know, what does it do with their spend with you? And then what does it do to their total cost? To, to have that redundancy, is that you know, a two-point hit is that a five-point hit? What is what is the cost of 
taking any know. piece of business and dividing it up? I don't know. Uh, and the reason I don't know is, is because uh, we have, we have business model, we have endless business models. Uh, sometimes the customer pays for the transfer. Sometimes we pay for the transfer. Uh, I don't know. And, and it depends, Ron, it depends on product. It depends on where the indigenous supply chain is today. How much of that is commodity? How much can be recreated? How much is power supply? How much is core electronics? Um, where's the memory coming from? Where's the plastic coming from? Where's the metal coming from? Where's the product shipped to? What's the logistics cost? What's the what's the redundancy of having now 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 customers have to they think they have to have two teams to look over you know two different geographies? I don't know what it costs. Um, I think it's very 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 product dependent. Um, yeah. I think for me, if I were on the other side of the table. I would think I would I would always be doing risk analysis, regardless if it's geopolitical or Mother Nature or whatever. Uh, and I think with with just about every customer we have, we have um, what do you call it? Kind of catastrophic planning. Um, the nice thing is is um, uh, we move stuff so frequently in the company that uh, a lot of our customers use a single geography and. Um, as long as we have the inventory pipeline, as long as we have the equipment, um, we can move stuff. If, if there's a catastrophic event with our size and scale, we can move stuff. We can move stuff very, very quickly and be up and running in, in another Jable geography pretty quick. Our overall, our overall floor space capacity as a company probably sits at about 70, 75%. So floor space is typically never an issue unless it's just a massive, um, yeah. maybe it's a wind turbine we're doing or a nacelle or something like that that takes up a bunch of space. But for, for the most part, um, we can move stuff really, really quick. And again, we have these contingency plans built in with just about all of our customers. And I would say, you know, for customers that are coming from you and, you know, you know this business as well as I do. I just, I think, you know, thinking about contingency is good but then people have to run a business and be practical about it. So uh, I think you ask a great question. What's the cost of, of contingency? Uh, you know, one of the first questions we ask, you know, we look for our customers, most of them are public, what's your gross margin and can you afford it? If you can afford it, great, have the Cadillac of contingencies, but most of them um, kind of are middle of the road on that. And boy, with all of the mother nature, with all of the unrest, with, with I, I think just through, since call it 1990 to now, um, if there's a handful of customers that have been shut down because of a bad issue for very long, I mean, even with COVID, even with India shutting down hard, the Malaysian government stepping in for a period of time, China around Wuhan being shut down, uh, Mexico being shut down for a period of time, the backlog that was created across our entire company, across every product was, was pretty de minimis. I think part of that, though, is there was a lot of demand destruction on the heels of the supply destruction. And I think that's part of what helped kind of mitigate maybe, the, the backlog. Maybe, of the, maybe not as much as you'd think. Yeah. Uh, not as much as you think. On the front end of this, there was very little demand destruction in, in April and May because it, everybody was kind of shut down and, and, and we just kept building. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen most of our demand adjustments mid-May to now. And I would say that um, surprisingly so far, and there's more to come, I'm sure of it. Uh, you know, this whole thing about, you know, it's going to be a V-shaped recovery. Mm, I don't know. Uh, and, and then, you know, everyone's looking at going, well, you know, the S&P is only like 4% from its all-time high. That's nonsense too, I think. And I'm not, a, I'm not a finance or a stock market prognosticator. I'll say it wouldn't work so damn hard. Uh, it's just... Um, so I think more of it's coming, Ron, but um, uh, I, I've been surprised. Like I said before, we have a lot of factories and our factories today are running between 70% and 100%. Um, our healthcare business is, is doing very well. 5G cloud is doing very well and on and on. I won't get into all that. Um, but I think it was, I think it was, there was some demand softening, but I also just think, um, uh, I think it was, I think it was kind of the flexibility and being able to sort the deck pretty quick and, and get people back up and running. Yeah, I think that's key. 
just a quick supplementary question that came in from the audience. And if anybody else has got questions, please go ahead and type them in. You talked about not that much product being existing product being um, moved out of China. What about new product introduction? You're constantly introducing new products. You're constantly working with innovators. When they're coming to you with new products, are, are they thinking differently about where they want them manufactured? They are. I would say, I would say um, both for existing customers that have a supply chain platform and then new customers to us, you know, there's more and more companies getting out of manufacturing all the time because if, if you don't have scale, you, you just can't do it efficiently. Uh, I think people, it's giving them pause. So we, we are probably on, on, on brand new things. We are, we are, we are seeing people, my gut is you can't bake the cake twice. So I don't know exactly what they would have done, but just, just conversationally, uh, I would say, more people are looking to ramp outside of China than maybe otherwise if things were maybe more normal. Yeah, so a bit of a rebalance really. And, you know, I guess that, I guess that happens from time to time. When you look, when you look way, beyond, um, way beyond this and you look at what the business will look like after and the lessons learned, um, and it sounds like you guys have, have fared really well and you're already on this journey, but what do you see the key factors to making, making your business more, more resilient and your customers more resilient and more agile at the same time? Is it more digital transformation? Is it more automation? Is it different business models? I'm a big believer in, um, I'm a big believer in structure and team. We have, we, have a, we have a very optimized structure. We run the whole company on a very low grade of SG&A. We put a lot of, of our EBITDA back into the company. And I like our, our team super experienced. Uh, and our approaches, I, I, I like our approach. Uh, not that we don't screw stuff up and get stuff wrong, but um, going forward, uh, I would say pre-COVID and post-COVID, I'll mix these. So we're always looking at, at advancing. So. Um, you know, back in the 90s, we did electronic modules. Today, we do full products. Um, uh, we're much more, uh, we, we, today we use IT as a strategy. We used to use IT as a necessity. Um, there was no such thing as machine learning and very little automation in the company 15 years ago. And now that dominates our production floors. I mentioned earlier, we're, we're on a path with a couple partnerships with existing customers in terms of augmented reality and um, being able to solve problems by using virtual and augmented reality solutions versus people jumping on a plane and, and burning themselves out by traveling 40 hours over to Asia somewhere. Uh, and, and our Asian population, who by the way is, and, and I say Asian, not China. Our Asian population is massively talented in terms of technologists, scientists, engineers, process folks, but being able to look at stuff in three dimension real time and be on a be on a call and have that be almost almost where you can touch it, uh, I think that's where we're going for sure. In terms of um, coming out of COVID, having talked to about 250 of the CEOs of of our customers. Um, everybody's talking about doing more on Zoom, more on Teams, et cetera. We'll see. I, um, I, got a, I got a thought on that where it's good and bad. I, I think um, what I've said to our team is, is we're gonna cut our travel budget back. Our fiscal year starts September 1. We're gonna cut our, we, we spend about $120 million a year in travel. So that's hotels, cars, all that stuff. We're gonna take 40 million out of that for sure next year. Um, but we're not gonna cut a penny of that uh, when it comes to customer facing or, or, or customer intimacy. Um, but you know, having our folks fly around to facilities and stuff, I think part with some of these type of tools, but then where we we're heading anyway in terms of the digital transformation, uh, I think that'll allow us to do that. Yeah, yeah. So do you see? You, you think automation, for example, has helped to level the play, playing field a little bit in terms of the cost of you know moving stuff outside of China, or do you or do you see that still being much more about supply chain and much more about 
white. I don't know that I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I look at it like that. Um, do I think automation levels the playing field where there's a labor arbitrage cost? Yeah. Yes. Um, but I, uh, but that's becoming that gap's closing. You know, there's no labor arbitrage today between China, Ukraine, China, Mexico, China, Penang. There used to be, uh, but there is between all of those locations and Switzerland, or all of those locations and the U.S. or all those locations. And I mean, you, you know the drill. Yeah. Um, but I think where I, I also observe companies getting themselves in in, in their thought process uh, a little misaligned is. Um, we watch people talk about, oh, we do, we do great things with automation and our engineers will go look at it. And for somebody that's building uh, 500 million of something that's not overly complicated, you get a good ROI on the automation. So demand set, very little volatility in demand, same thing every day, lights out. And, and we, do, we do some of that. But I mentioned earlier about uh, the world today demands agility and flexibility because, again, the forecasts are rubbish. And so um, this whole thing, we, you gotta be, I, we have to be very careful on how we think about automation. And our solution to it, right or wrong, is we've invested a ton in terms of base module automation where the automation can be changed over very quickly in terms of grippers. And, and, and so we can use the base model we can use the augmented reality. We can use the data collection and everything else on these base models. Yet these, these robots, for lack of a better word, um, can be changed over and do multiple tasks. So we can move them from product to product, geography to geography. Uh, you know, watching companies over the years invest a, you know, $100 million in a plant in their, in their robotics and then demand suffers or fluctuation or there's an engineering change and all of a sudden the utilization on that goes way, way down. I, I just think companies have to be very thoughtful. You know, there was a time where companies didn't give a lot of thought to their CapEx, uh, but they gave a lot of thought to their gross margin. And so watching companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars on automation, they, they, they've never got a payback on that. So. I think there's a time and place for it. We'll continue to invest in that. If I were to think about the areas of investment for us, anything to make our factory floors um, well advanced of most of their factory floors, because what we do is build stuff. I mean, our business, yes, there's a strategy. Yes, we have to know where we're going, but our business is about execution. And um, I, I say to our team all the time, we're not perfect, we're flawed. But boy, oh boy, when I walk through a Jabel factory, I, I really want it to have some snap to it relative to other factories, regardless of whether it's healthcare or automotive or cloud or 5G or whatever it may be. Yeah, and as you say, that automation has to be flexible. So the idea of flexible automation that's, you know, that's driven by software that can meet the tack time and change over time of your SMT lines and can work in conjunction with the high mix you have in certain environments you know, makes perfect sense and that gives you the agility. And if that's got the digital thread running through it, then it makes it easier to transfer or it makes it easier to build in that redundancy. You know, you, you said something, um, uh, thank you, by the way. Uh, we are using digital threads now everywhere. So, uh, and it used to be, it used to be really blah, uh, Boy, the digital threads we're using now on line layouts, trying different things, um, either running them in parallel or, or running all of our alpha beta through digital threads. That's a part of the business that five years ago we really didn't do. Um, we use digital threads now everywhere in terms of plant layouts, processes, alpha units, beta units. And boy, has that saved us a lot of, uh, A, a lot of... Um, the, the oops, it doesn't work quite right to uh, the actual lead times of when the design is complete to when we're, when we're, when we're actually releasing products. So um, thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, no, I think it's really important and the, the whole digital twin. And I think this, um, these crises never really start those kind of changes, but boy, I think this one will accelerate it. There'll be a desire to have that agility and I think digital transformations 
um, key to that. I could talk about digital transformation all day, so you have to stop me, Raman, because um, I know yeah, there's actually, some other yeah. stuff you want to cover. Yeah, in terms of you know coming out of of COVID and and what we've learned and what will be different, maybe what won't be different. Tell me how you think about or how your conversations are going with your customers around you know kind of two key issues post COVID. One is you know the role of inventory, and two visibility up and down the supply chain and and how that how you see that evolving specifically on the catalyst of COVID. What do you mean uh, in terms of how I see inventory? You mean, is, is it is it going to be riskier, less riskier? So um, a lot of our clients, and whenever I talk to any of the EMS guys, you know, uh, they very, very tightly manage inventory. They very tightly manage returns. And a lot of that's driven by, you know, an ROIC expectation and, and payment terms from, you know, their clients and things like that. I, I hold this belief that over the last five or six years, we've gotten to a point where inventory is, you know, thought of as bad no matter what. You just don't want to have inventory. And I've seen people, you know, make thoughtful decisions that I've, I've thought were wrong in terms of getting a little too skinny on some of the inventory. Some of the inventory that is single source that has long lead times to ramp up production of things like that. And so, Will people will people be a little bit looser on an inventory? Will they be a little more willing to add strategic pockets of inventory, or does nothing change on the other side of this? I'm actually we're actually Ron seeing companies be a lot more thoughtful around inventory, and it varies dramatically based on the product and the end market. So um, I would say um, if you look at our kind of networking capital in our healthcare business, it's very, very different than say um, our iPhone business, sure. which is very, very different than uh, uh, 5G base station business. So I, I think it varies all over the board. I would say that, um, I would say seven to 10 years ago, it was, constant non-value add bitching and arguing about who owns the inventory to the relationships we have today are so deep. I would, uh, I don't know how, the, I would say the majority of every, every customer we have today, we either build all their product or the, or the majority of the product. And so the conversations today are constantly around strategic planning regardless of who owns the inventory, regardless of the, if it's at the supplier, if it's in a hub, if it's at our facility, if the customer owns it. So, uh, and again, I don't in, in, you know, when I was our COO, uh, I gotten a lot more of these conversations. So uh, I'm speaking with maybe a degree of ignorance now, cause I don't, I don't sit in nearly as many of those meetings, but, um, for the for some of our big customers, right, 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 where I attend the executive business review, to the extent that there's an inventory pocket of discussion, and what we look at internally, uh, because we have a lot of invested capital in inventory, um, I think the conversations are richer. There's more conversations around risk management. There's more conversations around this whole thing around you know customers have gotten smarter, and nobody's gonna nobody's gonna trick Jable on hey. Uh, why don't you hold the inventory and then whatever, and we're not going to trick customers. And if you do that, it doesn't work anyway. Okay. So it's not, I mean, everybody kind of talks about it openly and it's really about um, setting up the supply chain for the variability, flexibility, gross margins, et cetera. Um, I would just say my observation, Ron, is um, the conversations are much more thoughtful than they've ever been. Yeah. Great. Yeah. How about supply chain? And, and by the way, the, 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 the relationships we have where the conversations aren't very meaningful. Um, they have the worst supply chains and there's more friction built into those relationships. Um, and it sucks. So, but I would say, I would say in general, um, really we do a lot of value stream mapping these days um, with our value stream mapping, lean engineers working side by side with theirs, starting from, 
you know, the sand to the silicon to the plastics and the polymer uh, all the way to it ends up in the hands of the consumer and or the enterprise. And there's been a lot of good work done working side by side value stream mapping that versus acting like two different independent entities. Good stuff. We are getting close to running out of time. I just wanted to touch on one quick point before we wrap up, Mark, and that's this issue of leadership. It's just one of those times where leadership is huge within, within any organization, within any enterprise. How important is that within within your organization, and and what do you think? Uh, what do you think kind of sets good leaders from bad leaders at, at the at the moment? Because it's just a, it's a it's a big time to be a leader. Yeah, so it's tumultuous times, um, and uh, and leadership does matter, and leadership matters all the time, and if you don't have it all the time, you can't just you can't just push a button and all of a sudden we're going to have good leadership when, when shit hits the fan, like we're going through now um, with lots of different issues. Internally, I would say um, we speak to our, I pay attention to our, I pay attention to all of our folks, but I, I pay acute attention to our top 240 leaders. Uh, I have 10 or 11 direct reports and then I, I pay very close attention to the top 240. For a company our size, we only have about 100 people that are VPs or higher, and then another 140 that are director level. Um, we talk endlessly about servant leadership. We talk endlessly about if you're going to get promoted in our company, it's all about serving those that work for you. Um, we do a very good job today. If people can't get that through their head and their ego turns to arrogance and there's narcissism and those type of things, we're just done. It's just we coach. We might, you know, if, if they're if they're high potential, we might get them a personal coach. I don't care about the results. Um, we talk a lot about serving those that 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 uh, um, that work for them, and and they guide and they steward. And, and then I think about um, inside of our own company. If I thought about things that we 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 talk about constantly and we measure, uh, it's things like perspective, empathy, compassion. Um, and being vulnerable. So being real. And um, I think the other thing that we talk to a lot with our leaderships about is, is if you want to be exec an, an executive, don't work here. You know, everybody in our company, because we run the whole company on three and a half, four percent SGNA. If you don't have a backpack on and you're not willing to work hard, you know, there's lots of other organizations where it's really cool. You can go be an executive. And I don't want executives in our company because we just, we got too much shit to do. And, um, and I think the other thing is, is um, we often talk about I, in, our, in our leadership, in our, in our leadership development, and then just at staff. I, I, I'm not much for slides, but every now and then, if people are feeling a little cranky or getting out of kilter, I have, I have a couple slides. I speak at I speak at two or three universities a year, and I've got this little slide deck. But there's always one slide. And it says, you know what? Um, people are going to forget what you did. And people are going to forget what you said, but they're never going to forget how they make you feel. And uh, I think that really kind of constitutes what we think about um, leadership in our company. You know, we don't have a big brand. Uh, all of our customers have the big brands. We have a silent brand on purpose. We're the brand behind the brand. And all of our people have choices. They're really talented. But yet our turnover rate, our, our turnover rate when we don't want people to leave is very, very low. And I think people feel, um, feel kind of this thing, uh, value set, culture, whatever you want to call it. But boy, do I think, um, I think, you know, you read leadership books and sometimes you don't see perspective. Sometimes you don't see empathy, compassion, vulnerability. I think those are huge, at least, at least in our Jable family. Yeah. So Mark, I'm going to put you on the spot, I think, here. My favorite story I've ever heard from you, you were telling me about, and I don't think it was a direct report, but maybe it was one of your direct reports, direct reports, and, you know, they were really struggling with something, felt like they were having a bad day, and you guys went and got in your truck, and you drove this person somewhere to give them some perspective. Yeah. 
Can you can you share that? Can you share that story? Because that story has has stuck with me for a very long time. Yeah. So um, I've been on the board of of Hopkins Pediatrics for. In fact, I'm exiting off because I hit my 20 year limit. Um, but I had a, I had an employee who who um, was fairly senior in the company. I was in the office at about 6:15 in the morning. They came over, and they're bitching about the fact that they were building a new house and. And, um, and one of the carpenters had scratched the railing in the house the night before. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm like watching this person kind of agonize over this scratch on the railing. And, and, and I said, um, hey, what are you doing for lunch today? I, got, I said, cancel your plans. Let's go to lunch. We jump in my truck. I take him down to the pediatric hospital. I know everybody there um, or most of the folks there. Uh, this individual is looking at me. What are we doing? Hey, we got something to do. We go to the third floor. It's the oncology ward for pediatrics. And the elevator opens and this individual says to me, what are we doing? And I said, I'm doing nothing, but you're going to just go walk around for five, 10 minutes. And they said, am I allowed to? Yes, I've cleared it. They walk around and we get back in the elevator. And I just said, how concerned are you about the scratch on your railing? And this is, I, I, I shared that with you, Ron. I remember we were having a glass of wine or something. I, I just think, um, I just think perspective is huge. And we could talk another hour about, about what's happened with the recent death with George Floyd. And, and I mean, perspective in life is immense. And, um, and I, I, watch, I watch some of our people get worked up over the things that are such nonsense. And um, that's why we talk so much, I think, about perspective in terms of our leaders, because I feel like in your life, whether you whether you deal with, you know, we, I have a big Italian family. My wife has a big Irish family. It makes for really interesting times. Um, but we have everything in our family from addiction to divorce to uh, parents dying to dogs dying to um, abuse to, I mean, we have a huge family. Um, and, and I have a daughter with special needs. So um, I just think when you go through stuff like that, it sucks. But if you can just have it kind of burn in your head about um, perspective and perspective for others, it sure does make you a, a better supervisor over others. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, you know, we I started this conversation with, you know, the idea, this part of the conversation with the idea of the challenges of leadership. I guess, the leadership is the same throughout. Has it changed much during the crisis? Because I guess you must manage a lot of your team pretty remotely anyway. You're so scattered around the world. Um, I guess you're using Zoom more, but it's always been, you know, remote. Um, has it changed? The topics we're talking about now have changed a bit. So mm -hmm. we still have the check. We still we still have the check the box. We still I still want the company to grow. I still want to be a really safe pair of hands for our customers. We still have to execute in our factories. Um, uh, the things that I think have come to the forefront though over this time are uh, disruptions like this stress the heck out of our processes and our systems. And, uh, and, it, and it shows our flaws as an organization. And so um, we're spending a lot of time figuring out, okay, what's flawed? What weren't we prepared for? How does this make us better? Where, where were our weak points? Um, uh, where were the tendons stretched? Uh, and that's been really healthy. Um, number two is, is we obsess about safety. So when you have 50 plus million square feet of factory space, it's really easy for people to get hurt. And now, now we've got not only worrying about safety, but um, keeping people uh, COVID free, virus free. Here's a, here's kind of a cool statistic. And I, and I, and I give credit to our folks in China because they're the ones that kicked off the processes and the protocols and we've advanced those, but of our 230,000 people, we've had less than 300 cases across the company confirmed and we're doing lots of testing. We do, we're doing thermal testing at every factory. Uh, we have, we have significant protocols. If you don't feel well, don't come to work. No questions asked. So I feel really good about that. Um, and that's a burden on the organization in terms of we got all this business to run. Now we got to keep our people kind of virus free. And then I'll also tell you that cash management 
is, is a big, big issue to us. So our balance sheet's very strong. We just went out and raised uh, some more money. If the debt markets continue to be where they're going and spreads continue to, to ratchet in, we'll probably go add, maybe add a little bit more debt. Um, but you know, the other topic that we're talking about, uh, the last three meetings that I've gotten together with my staff on is, what mental health issues are we gonna see come to the forefront based on people coming back to work? And um, maybe, it's, maybe it's tangential to what I said earlier, but when you have all the employees we have, we revert to the mean on everything. We have a certain amount of addicts, uh, whether, it's, whether people are addicted to sex or alcohol or drugs or whatever. We have people in abusive relationships and now they've been quarantined. We have people in bad relationships that have gotten worse. We have people that um, have, have been very successful with their addictions, but they haven't been able to get to their sponsors. How's that gonna impact them? And then we have people that are generally anxious and depressed and, and, and climbing the walls. So the last three staff meetings, we've closed each one of those with, how are we as a leadership team going to let everybody know that in these topics that are tough to talk about in normal times, that it's okay to come forth and say, hey, I'm really struggling. And so we're pretty advanced already in um, an internal uh, Jable uh, website where people can go on and for any type of, or most any type of mental health issue, they can click on it and, and get some help pretty quick because we're fooling ourselves if we think that everybody's just going to come back to this and everything's going to be okay. Um, so I, I would say that's kind of how things have stayed the same, but, but maybe some different topics in terms of what I find or what we find important. Yeah. And I think things are definitely changing there and it's um, you know, it's really, it's really interesting when, when I look at that, because you talk about your family having, all those different things, but the Jable family is is a huge family, and you've got to, you know, step up and do a little bit of parenting there, and make sure everybody's got access to the help they need, and that has to filter down through the whole the whole organisation because you can't go and put your arms around two hundred thousand people. You've got to you've got to make sure that that's that's cultural, I guess. So it's got to be, you know, seen throughout the. Uh, the whole organization. I think that's fundamental. Guys, I think we should get wrapped up here. Uh, I understand uh, our audience have got, have got other stuff to do with their day and I thank them very much for staying with us. Mark, awesome conversation. Um, thank you very much, have, Mark. Yeah, yeah, by the way, all, everybody, everybody the out there, uh, I know how busy everybody is. I, um, I apologize for being a few minutes late. I hate to be late to anything. I just couldn't get this thing to come up on my computer and, and it did, so I apologize for that. Uh, guys, Ron, um, I actually remind you, Ron, time's going by really quick. I think I've probably known you closer to 15 to 18 years, but we're, who's counting? But thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. And you know, the other issue is, is, is if there's folks out there that are trying to figure stuff out, um, and I'm not necessarily looking for business, although we're always looking for business, but if they need some help, um, they can always reach out and I can put them in touch with, um, with some of our folks. And if we can help out, even if they don't use Jable to build their stuff or whatever, we'd be more than happy to help out, Ron. Yeah. Thank you very much, Margaret. Really appreciate we'll, it. We'll connect people by this channel so everybody can find me or Ron on LinkedIn. And if they've got something they want to divert through to Mark, just let us know. And and we'll do that. It's been a fantastic conversation. Mark, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. No worries about the technology thing at all. There's a lot of people uh, using this stuff at the moment. So uh, I think bandwidth's pretty crowded out as yeah, well. Yeah, we pride ourselves. We pride ourselves of being a really advanced technology company. And I would say one out of every 10 meetings gets screwed up. So someday if I figure that out, I'll get the Nobel Peace Prize, but I don't think I ever will. And Ron, um, once we get post COVID, we'll, um, We'll drink a beer and get out on the water and try to chase some fish. But again, so long and thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much, you Mark. So much, Mark. Thank it. you, Ron. Thanks everybody for taking part today. And we look forward to seeing you all next week on Maiden. Thank you very much.